to destroy it. But let's let's park that for a second. Um, the, the, the situation in Southport is, is, as you say, it's a very interesting example of what can happen with social media. I don't care about these, uh, these agitators like uh, the people you mentioned, let alone uh, Alistair Campbell, who's a fascinating man in uh, his, the projection that he, mm. uh, that he is able uh, I completely agree. Uh, to do. It's, it's, quite, it's extraordinary. He, he's, he's a very bizarre man. He, um, you know, I mean, I, mean, I mean, the idea that we need to listen to Alistair Campbell talking about truth in public life is kind of preposterous mm. to me and anyone else with a long-term memory. Uh, but, but anyway, I don't care about these people. They just go around uh, behaving as bullies and then as victims. It's, it's, it's amazing. But, uh, but the Southport thing is extremely important to, 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 to linger on for a moment because actually it goes back to something we were talking about earlier. Southport was such a heinous crime in an area where, I mean, you know, unfortunately we've got sort of used to terrorist attacks in some of our major cities, uh, but uh, a, a, an appalling, brutal uh, um, attack like this on the weakest and most vulnerable target is something which so horrifies people that of course they scour around looking for people to blame. Now we'll see uh, when the trial uh, uh, comes up, if there were any motivations or, uh, as it were, inspirations for this vile uh, young man who did this. But it, it, I have to say, having, having uh, you know, covered a lot of terrorist incidents in my life, one of the things that, are, that anyone who's wise knows is just wait, just wait and see who is responsible before you start sounding off. And unfortunately, you know, there's <laughs> lots of people who don't have uh, the discipline to do that. Some people who in the immediate aftermath of something are just, as I say, scouring for people to blame. I think that there, is, there, there are several lessons to be taken from this, though. One is, we cannot be in a situation in our society in Britain or anywhere else where we are only one madman's attack from uh, 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 responses like this happening. I have argued for decades now that if we had a sensible asylum policy and a reasonable immigration policy and we didn't allow thousands of people to come into the country illegally every few months, that, you know, we could have a reasonable uh, um, uh, kind of migration policy like we had in the 1990s when tens of thousands of people were net migration a year. We don't have that situation in Britain now. We do have thousands of people coming illegally all the time and never being returned. And we had net migration of almost three quarters of a million in the last year of a conservative government mm. that had promised in election after election to bring immigration, net legal migration down to 1990s levels. And they didn't. Labour, Conservative, the Liberal Democrats, all in government, promised to bring down net migration and to stop illegal migration, and instead they ramped it up and ramped it up and ramped it up. The consequences of that are totally predictable. When people say now that my book, The Strange Death of Europe, was prophetic, I say it wasn't prophetic. You didn't need to be a prophet to see the loss of trust in society, the scouring around for people to blame, the much more. You didn't need to be a prophet to see that. You just had to have your eyes open and be willing to say what you saw with them. And too few people were willing to do that. And when you have a situation like Southport, it reminds you that the situation which our, our politicians have created in Britain is such that you are only one madman's behavior away from having significant civil unrest. And the problem for the Starmer government is they resurrected the EDL that, as I understand, has not existed as an organization for 10 years. As, and they've been desperately trying to say that these were coordinated and people were coordinated. And that was, by the way, I, why I got sort of dragged into this madness, was because people were desperate to have people they could say were responsible for the, the, the terrible outrages that happened uh, in communities uh, um, across the north of England, including, by the way, um, uh, uh, Muslim gangs of, of, of Muslim men caught on camera, some of them with weapons, uh, some of whom, by the way, were being uh, advised by a policeman to leave the weapons in the mosque so that they didn't get into trouble. And that's an amazing thing to see, but again, kind of to be expected. 
But what is it about uh, about uh, our society that, that people were looking for people to, who they could say had coordinated this? I would say it's much worse than that. Uh, 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 would that there were clear coordinators here because you could go after the people. But there weren't peers. As I understand it, from what I can see, this was um, angry uh, crowds of people that sometimes became mobs and they weren't coordinated. That is much harder and much more worrying because it... Well, I would, because take, I would take slight Starmer issue, OK. And I would the rest take, don't I, seem to know what to do I about it. I would take it. slight issue because I think when you have massive followings on social media like Andrew Tate, and I challenged him about this mm. before I went away and we had a pretty yeah, robust exchange. Yeah. Um, but also Tommy Robinson, who's been allowed back onto X by Elon Musk, which I don't think was a good decision, but we can debate that another time. But when they have these big followings and they are actively promoting completely wrong information, suggesting that the perpetrator mm. was an illegal Muslim immigrant to the country on a terror watch list, that's when the trouble starts. I suppose my question for you, Doug, would sure. be... Well, well, let me just ask you a question for you, which is this. That mm. I accept that what you said uh, in this clip had nothing to do with what was happening, and it was ridiculous that he got brought in. The point I would pick you up on is, on, on a second occasion, you posted on X ahead of a, a, pra a planned pro-Palestine march on Remembrance Sunday last year. They planned to defame mm. our war dead and desecrate the Cenotaph. If such mm. a march goes ahead, then the people of Britain must come out and stop these barbarians. And I, I would yeah. simply ask you, on both of these cases, you appear to be advocating directly for mob rule to take part if it... If it comes oh. to it. And, I, well, I, I'll give you the chance of it to, to explain what you really mean, if that's not the case. But you have a big position of influence. You know, I think you're a very, very smart guy. I love having you on the programme. I love talking to you. It's been a great conversation today. But it, it, when you say things like, the people of Britain must come out and stop these barbarians, or the public mm. will have to sort this out themselves, do you see mm. that there is a peril there in somebody like you with a big following appearing to advocate mm. mob rule? Well, of course they're not for, for mob rule. Um, look, why is our country in this position, Piers? Why is it that um, tens of thousands of people, in fact, hundreds of thousands sometimes, were shutting down the centre of London week in, week out, something, by the way, the French government wouldn't allow in Paris, but was happening week in, week out, with people being intimidated on the streets of London and other cities, with anti-Semitic and racist abuse from these marchers, every single week, all the time, nobody in government just sort of said, look, OK, we get the point, right? but you don't have the right to intimidate people. Why do we have people outside Westminster Abbey um, uh, uh, calling out jihadist chants? Why do we have people on the streets of London uh, who you've some of them you've you've I've seen you um, mm. countering on your show, calling for jihad on the streets of London. Mm. Why are we in this position that on the 11th of November, on the day that is most sacred to the British soul, where we remember our forebears who fought for our freedom, that we should have a threat of hundreds of thousands of people who um, hate Britain, who never, ever carry a British flag, would never, ever do anything that is patriotic for Britain. Why, do, why are we in this situation in Britain? I would tell you why. Again, it's because our government has lost control of the borders for years. And now we are a very low trust, very febrile society in Britain, where we used to be very high trust and where we didn't used to be at risk of having riots at any moment because of one madman anywhere in the country. We're in this situation because the generations of politicians of all parties have brought us here. That is on them. But my question is always, why has it got to be always a one-way street on the toleration? We are forever being told about how tolerant we have to be. 
But it seems to me that the people saying that are highly intolerant of us and our traditions. The reason why the cenotaph matters is because it is a holy place in the British psyche. The reason why the statue of Churchill, which is always being attacked, is so sacred to us is because it speaks to the sacrifice of our forebears. And the knowledge that we in Britain are a good country, who have been a force for good in the world, overwhelmingly, and that we have people in our country now who do not believe in that, who believe we have been a force for evil in the world, who march against our country, who threaten to despoil our holy places and our, our very identity. The British public should not endlessly be uh, putting up with being insulted and defamed. And my belief is that we have the right to stand up for our traditions and a right to stand up for our holy places and our holy days. And that, and the, the situation we're in is that if anyone does say we must, uh, you know, if, if, if people are going to threaten to attack the cenotaph, we should defend it. People will say the people who defend it are far right extremists. By the way, something they would never say ag against the people the other way around who would deface the cenotaph. So, uh, uh, you know, we have been transformed as a society into an incredibly febrile, low trust society. And as Nadim Sahawi said in The Times the other week, he wrote a piece where he mentioned me and he said, he said, uh, he said that Douglas Murray has said for years that what is now happening would happen. And as he said, I never did it in the spirit of glee. I did it in deep lamentation. I did it in deep lamentation because I could see what was being done to Britain and the British people. And I warned against it. And Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrats, SNP and others all just merrily went along the way of making our society something different. I never wanted that. I don't think the British people wanted that. We never voted for that. When we were asked whether we wanted it, we said no and they didn't listen. So we'll see what happens in the years ahead, and we'll see if Starmer and co have any idea of how to solve the problems that generations of politicians have caused in Britain. But no, I did not want to be a, 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 in a society in Britain where we have jihadists living in our midst, where we have terrorists that we welcome in, where we give every advantage to people who hate us, or at the very least do not like us. I never wanted that to be the case. I'm extremely sad that it is the case. I'd love to see it turned around. I, I, I know how it could happen. I have very low belief that we have anyone in charge in Britain who knows what to do about this. But it's a problem they've brought on our society and I profoundly wish that they had not. We've run out of time. Douglas, I could talk to you for hours. Just finally, you've got a speaking tour coming up, which begins in Florida, it's through America. Uh, you know America extremely well. You've lived there, worked there for many years, as I have. Uh, just very quickly, the dynamic of this presidential race has obviously dramatically changed mm. with Joe Biden pulling out, yes. Kamala Harris coming in. There's no doubt she's got a bit of momentum that she's built, which Biden certainly mm -hmm. didn't have. Who is going to win this election? <laughs> I'm not going to uh, uh, make a prediction, Piers, because I know, like you do, that... Uh, if a week was a long time in politics <laughs> in the 1970s, these days a weekend is like a year. I mean, it's only a few weeks ago mm. that there was the attempted assassination of Donald Trump. It's only a few weeks ago that the Democrat media in the US was pretending that Joe Biden had another four years in him and he'd never mm. been fitter and in better health and wow, did he have it in him and he was all pepped up. Uh, that's only a few, year, a few weeks ago as well, feels like a few years. Um, so I don't know. These are long, long weeks and long months. There's a long way to go in this campaign. Uh, I, I think that there's there's one thing particular to watch out for, which is the the, the Kamala Harris bounce, which I would <laughs> I have to say I would not have expected. I mean, six months ago, the idea that Kamala Harris would mm. be the uh, Democrat nominee was the sort of stuff of, of laughter. OK, now she is. Uh, um, the thing to watch out for is is she going to say anything about actual policy? Mm. Are she and Walsh going to put any meat on the bone? 
I suspect not. And it's going to be mm. very interesting to see whether the American media lets them get away with that. Mm. Uh, uh, Harris Walsh sat down for an interview the other day where Walsh, her running mate, looked like an emotional support uh, um, animal, frankly. Yeah. He was sort of sitting by her side, n nodding and sort of... It uh, was I was asked yeah. a couple of questions at the end and that, that was, it was awful. But the really interesting thing is, Piers, is that all the criticisms you can make of Trump and the Republicans, and we could go through and we could rehearse all day, but there, there has been a, a, a quite a lot of discussion of what would happen in a, in a, in a second Trump administration. Mm. The, 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 the harris Walsh administration, it's totally unclear to me yeah. uh, what they plan to do. Are they going to do anything? What, what, what is their plan on inflation? I mean, all you get is that Kamala Harris will say, you know, inflation is a really big problem and that's why it's a problem. We need you know, to look you know at what what's going to be a massive night, is. Douglas? And, I've got to wrap it, but the, the big night is going to mm. be the 10th of September when Trump yes, gets on that yes. debate stage with Kamala Harris. The last debate had unbelievably but, huge ramifications. And I I've agree, got a but feeling, just a I've very got a quick feeling, one, Piers. I've got a feeling this one could decide the election. It could do, but look at how far out of the election it is. Yeah, yeah. It's still weeks ahead yeah, I agree. of the election. It's in September for an election in November. But just one final thing. It's possible that Kamala Harris and Tim Walsh will get away with this. I'll tell you why. Because we have a good example in Britain. Yeah. Almost nobody was running to the polls in Britain, desperate to vote for, uh, um, uh, f f for our current prime minister. Some people are desperate to run to the polls to vote for Kamala Harris. It's true, and I didn't foresee that. But, but the way in which Starmer and the Labour Party came in was, we'll say nothing about what we're going to do until after we get nobly voted into office. And now, of course, we're being told about the tax. Yeah, uh, well, it's the Joe so Biden of basement course. strategy. Will, will, Harris Walsh, will Harris Walsh get away with the same manoeuvre? Mm. They might do. We'll see. We will. Douglas, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Great pleasure as always. Thanks, Piers.